welcome to this uh, second panel of, um, of the Affirmative Feminism uh, seminar series. Um, the first panel that we had last Friday was on, um, was on production. The third panel, which we'll have uh, next Friday at 10, will be on curation and distribution. And this panel today, uh, this seminar today, will be on um, aesthetics and um, representation. So um, I'll give you first a little bit of background about this seminar series, and then I'll um, introduce the, the panelists and uh, they will present uh, their work and their views on affirmative aesthetics and representation. Um, and then we'll have a conversation which, in which we will invite uh, the audience. So uh, feel free um, to ask uh, questions at any time. Um, so I am uh, Maud Kutorik. I work at the University of Bergen in digital culture. I uh, study uh, gender, sexuality and race in contemporary cinema and digital films, um, including augmented reality and virtual reality. And I especially look at how relations of power unfold on screen and through uh, representation of everyday spaces. So um, what I realized is that gender, space, and, uh, and sexuality, and race were defined in general in terms of, um, of binaries. And um, that there was a lot of uh, negativity um, around, um, around those themes in uh, theory, but also in, um, in films. And um, what I mean by negativity is that um, there, there, there is a lot of critique around um, structures of power and around inequalities, but there are not that many examples that actually propose other models and alternatives to, um, alternatives to, to the status quo. And not that many that also present possible futures that would be uh, diverse and inclusive. So, um, what I, uh, what I started to uh, look at, I started to actually look for those um, affirmative examples. So um, those examples that propose something different. And, um, and I realized uh, in my work that what we need to look at, we need to look at the whole full, uh, the, the full um, life cycle of a film and not only at what happens on screen, um, so at also production and issues of distribution to understand what um, actually comes on screen. And uh, this is also fueled by the Me Too movement, which pointed uh, in this uh, direction. So this is how this uh, seminar series uh, was born. And this is the, the start of my research of combining production, aesthetic, and, um, and distribution in, in, this, in the same um, kind of organic research. So um, to do this, I invited uh, today um, uh, three excellent panelists. Uh, first, I'll introduce Anna Bachman Rogers, who is a professor of culture, aesthetics, and uh, feminist theory at the University of Göteborg. Um, Anna, if you want to turn on your camera. Um, hello. <laughs> I'll uh, introduce also Ilya Zilak, uh, who is who is uh, woken up very early uh, this morning to be with us, and uh, she is uh, <laughs> she's a physician and an artist and creator of uh, VR artworks. And uh, Rosalind Jill is a professor of uh, social and cultural analysis at City University of London. Hello. Um, and uh, Emily Wright, who is an artist and a research assistant uh, for this uh, project. And uh, she'll give you a bit of uh, um, house rules now. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily. I'll be available today uh, moderating in the chat room. So please feel free to post any comments that may come up uh, throughout the talk. And then also, if you have any questions that come up, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, today, we will be recording uh, the seminar for further research and distribution. Um, so just so you're all aware that will be happening. So you're welcome to ask questions anonymously if that's um, something that you'd prefer to do. Uh, we also um, 
if you'd like to repost anything about the seminar today on Twitter, uh, please use the hashtag affirmative feminism um, and the handle modernable, which are both available now in the in the chat to the side. Um, yeah, see you in the chat room and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Um, you can also uh, raise your hands if you want to ask your question with um, in a, in a voice uh, in an oral way. So um, I'll first start with uh, I think Anna will first start with uh, telling us how uh, she sees um, affirmative um, affirmativity in her work and um, and I really want to um, hear what you uh, what you have to tell us this morning. So the floor is yours. So I'll share uh, what Anna has shared with us um, for you this morning. Um, yes. And um, I, I can't see the um, this slide mode, but it, it doesn't matter. Uh, firstly, I should apologise. There's ongoing building work happening on my uh, on my apartment block, so it's been nearly a year of pneumatic drilling and banging, and uh, they had relieved us of this problem for about a week, but they've magically decided to um, to start drilling and banging again. So I do apologise if that interferes with what I'm saying. And today I want to talk about my forthcoming book, which is on Barbara Loddon's film, uh, Wonder, which was released in 1970. Um, so the, the topic of my very short talk today, uh, which is approximately seven or eight minutes, is um, on wonder and contemporary feminism and is taken from the final section of my book. So um, my work, broadly speaking, centres on women's image making as intervention in and critique of both mainstream forms of culture, but also of mainstream forms of feminism. So this is to say that I believe the issue at stake is not so much that we live in a world that is obviously saturated in images, although I think this has inured us to reading images carefully. That is, as the image becomes seemingly, seemingly inexhaustible, we grow ever more exhausted. But that we must constantly bear in mind that images are always already implicated or intimately bound up with socio-symbolic structures and our own subjectivities. And thus, the images can either work to shore up or undermine those structures. So with this in mind, I want to explore a very specific case, a film that destabilizes, in my view, central conceptions of both feminism and American cultural identity. A film that is, I believe, far too iconoclastic for even the American counterculture. And this film is Barbara Loddon's uh, Wonder, which I um, mentioned, um, and on which I have a book coming out this year called Still Life Notes on Barbara Loddon's Wonder, which you can see on the slide there. So Loddon's film does not partake in the so-called pathos of failure, that, specific, that specifically pre-apic form of post-60s cinema that arose around political stasis, impotence and disillusionment expressed through a form of white masculine crisis on the cusp of erupting into violence. Moreover, Wanda rejects what Leo Bassani has called a culture of redemption, the cardinal conjecture of which is that a certain type of repetition of experience in art repairs inherently damaged or valueless experience. So I would argue that Loddin's film stage is a far more intricate, subtle and somatic form of crisis that is both distinctively feminine and working class. At the center of Wanda is a crisis of movement that problematizes definitively who gets to take up space, both bodily and geographically. So that is Wanda is not the lone American outlaw of myth. Loddon performs her feminist politics as a question of the body and its symptoms. We can see this in her performance of Wanda as a woman who is continually on the threshold, unable to claim that most elusive and exclusive of feminist tenets, a space and room of one's own. So the perennial critique levelled at narratives that centre radical denial, especially those harnessed through negative affect, 
is that they are, in essence, fundamentally disempowering to the reader or viewer. Art forms that bring us into confrontation with crushing and bleak realities are often decried on the grounds of making those on their receiving end feel impotent and by extension guilty. In other words, they often induce negative affect in their audience, which more often than not results in a form of critical discourse that denounces such work as willfully irresponsible. And Wanda's reception is just one case in point. So drawing on Anne Kvetkovich's work on depression as a public feeling, I suggest that in making of depression and its effective survival mechanisms a form of grand narrative, we also refuse to assuage the discomfort the viewer or reader may feel. This is not the same thing I countenance as repurposing it. The lack of resolution, the refusal of a specific notion of illumination or epiphany, is precisely the point. Wonder is a film which could not fit within the strictures and mores of its contemporary feminist moment. Elena Goldfinkel notes that Lodin avowedly avoids feminist models of representation as social or political correction. Wonder proffers a counter narrative to the very notion of artistic reproduction as a means to collective feminist organization. It holds a disarticulated, muted, numb, and seemingly passive women at its core and demands that the viewer reckon with the very possibility of self-definition as a privilege. This is the feminist mantle that Loddon offers us. Importantly though, her politics cleaves neither to the images of women debate of its own historical context, nor to our current somewhat limited discourse, in my view, on the politics of representation. This latter reiteration, which has much in common in fact, with those earlier debates in terms of its myopic and relentless focus on positivity and self-empowerment, now recuperated through a neoliberal model of autonomous self-fashioning and individualized subjectivity. Loddon, if she were alive today, would, I contend, have felt equally constrained and underserved by this contemporary discourse. It is my belief that Wanda is the film of our political moment, and I'm not alone in this conviction, as Gorfinkel also describes the film as an unforeseen, untimely feminist cinema that has transcended the reaches of historical time to find solidarity in or with a current audience. Wanda is indeed a profoundly prescient and feminist statement, which we would allow to fade back into obscurity at our peril. The film has so much to teach us as a form of counter cinema, the likes of which remain all too rare. What defines Loddon's counter cinema as a political gesture, though, has little to do with the dominant contemporary feminist narrative. Rather, I regard the film as exemplary of Claire Johnston's definition of women's counter cinema because of its direct confrontation with cinema as an apparatus of patriarchal and capitalist ideology. Johnston's critique of feminist recuperation of so-called cinema verite techniques was incisive and excoriating, and it's worth quoting her, in my view, underutilized essay at length. She writes, clearly, if we accept that cinema involves the production of signs, the idea of non-intervention is pure mystification. The sign is always a product. What the camera, in fact, grasps is the natural world of the dominant ideology. Women's cinema cannot afford such idealism. It is for this very reason that the classification of wonder as cinema verite is in my view problematic, not merely because it seemingly undermines Loddon's agency as an artist, but because this taxonomy fails to account for the precision of the film's feminist politics at the level of the image. Wonder stages on a granular level, the slow and steady accretion of a radical feminist intervention into image making as a commercial enterprise. It is all there for us to see, in the margin, in the use of dead time, in the ellipsis, in its slowness, in its negativity and refusal, in its mundanity, in its ugliness, in its refusal to turn away or to soothe, if we choose to look carefully. It is there in the genius of Loddon's performance of negative capability, of passivity, of hesitancy, of muteness, of numbness, of quiet subversion. It is there for us to behold in this narrative that centers on a woman diminished by the very spaces, people and political landscape that surround her. A woman who disintegrates before our eyes. A woman to whom seemingly nobody pays loving attention. 
This woman, Wanda, who is no positive form of role model, can tell us precisely what we are missing, and not only on our cinema screens, but in our politics. We might reject her because she, feel, she makes us feel our complicity, our hypocrisy, our indifference to social systems designed to perpetuate egregious inequities and in political policies that summon slow death through daily attrition. That affliction of guilt may feel like too much of a weight to bear or body forth, but Lodin's performance reminds us that this pales into insignificance in comparison to the weight that wonder carries, a burden that is incontrovertible, unchanging, and is with her and those like her for all time. This is a film that holds within it the sadness of the world and asks us to attend to that as an ethical calling. Wonder's bleak truth is the point. It impresses on us a duty of care that we missed then, that we are still missing, that we have seemingly always fundamentally missed. It reminds us that willful neglect and a refusal to see are precisely political acts of violence. It urges us to respond to the unendurable realities of the political and social world in which we live and to those it systematically disenfranchises, dehumanizes, obliterates and discards. So that's, that's my bit before the discussion. Again, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, Elia, would you, would you like to uh, share with us um, how you see your work as affirmative, and um, or other people's work? How do you um, really? Yeah. Understand? Thank you. Um, I mean, I love going uh, after Anna because uh, so much of what she talked about is what I am about. I'm just going to mention one thing uh, that she said, which I'm going to start with, um, which is images are always bound up with socio-symbolic structures, which I think is um, really important. And so um, in my work, uh, I'm just going to generally say that I'm not as interested in images per se as I in, am interested in disrupting sort of the procedural logic of how hierarchies and binaries are set up um, and creating uh, spaces um, and ways for um, people to negotiate different ways of being in the world. So um, I think that that's where my idea of affirmation comes from. Um, what I'm interested in, in, in my work in, in virtual reality is um, VR has this possibility of setting up this sort of queer oscillation between self and other inside and outside real and artificial that allows for um, different possibilities um, that are almost incomprehensible in real world terms. Um, so that's why I find it such a magical uh, uh, medium to work in. Um, I would also just point out that I see my work as in between art and entertainment. I'm really keen on not trying to box it into art world um, sort of place because I think that the audience reaches is much less and then it becomes again part of this hierarchy um, that I really want to try and disrupt. Um, uh, and so let me just, um, I would like to start by saying um, part of what I'm trying to do is create films, interactive films, which um, allow for a kind of Brechtian distancing effect where it seems very familiar, but at the same time kind of strange. So it's in that liminal space between the familiar and the strange that all the possibilities come up. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the aesthetic decisions um, that I made in one work and then I'll show another one. This is just a trailer from the first virtual reality work that um, we made, uh, which is called, uh, uh, and when I say we, I say, I'm my long-term artistic partner is Cyril Sobolski. Um, and we've been working for over 10 years together. He's an interactive designer. Um, so this is a trailer from uh, Queer Skin's um, A Love Story which is an interactive virtual reality piece. And I'll just and play it and then I'll talk about some of the aesthetic decisions that we made in it. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Hold on a second. Share screen. And let's do this. Okay. <laughs> Mid-Missouri as 
He's been dead to you for a long time, hasn't he? Ever since James. When's the last time you spoke to him or wrote to him? He was a disgrace. To be so uncontained. To not have to worry about the edges of things. What is that but the definition of joy? Okay, now let me try to un unshare my screen. Here we go. Okay, um, so one of the aesthetic decisions that um, I make is a real appreciation of genre because um, although we may not be aware of it, um, we are all familiar with cinematic language. So we kind of know how the melodrama should run, how the cowboy story should run, how the romance should run. Um, and I sort of play on those expectations. In this case, the inspiration was the 1950s melodramas of Douglas Sirk, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, and, and trying to play with how people uh, anticipate what is coming. So in this, it's a story of um, a couple who's traveling down this Missouri road um, and you realize that they have lost their son. Um, some people will end up realizing they've lost their son to AIDS, but it's not specifically mentioned and that was actually on purpose. Um, but um, you are really kept literally in your seat in this um, experience. You can't move from it. It is, feels repressive on a physical level um, and your way of gaining agency is to create the character of the man who has died from this box of objects, and many of which will never be seen in virtual reality <laughs> again. And part of it is that um, even though it seems, uh, uh, the other aesthetic choice I would say would be um, the choice of a hyper real, super artificial aesthetic. So it's real, but it goes to the level of hyper reals, as you can see by the color palette that we chose. Um, and then the sort of rear window projection effect, um, which is sort of classic, which was done. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute on um, why we did it. Um, so uh, the idea that you sort of, it's an artificial structure, it feels like um, kind of almost on the border of kitsch, I would say, but then you are actually charged with creating this character. So how you relate to these objects in the box will depend on your own history, on your own memories, on your own relationship to those things, which include a Christian cross, we have um, uh, vintage Tom of Finland physique pictorials. Um, it, it, there's a range of things. So that will be how you construct this main character. Um, so we give you that agency, which is really different from what you would expect from melodrama, um, which is very much leads you along. The other thing that we did besides um, playing with genre and then playing with um, sort of the hyper real artificial aesthetic, but giving you agency um, is we, tried to go against what is really a prevalent aesthetic in VR, which is what I call the Pixar aesthetic, which is this super kitschy, um, I'm sorry, I hate Pixar, um, feeling of wholeness, of, of, of just like all being together. You know, it's like Milan Kundera's second tier. We're all together in this, we're all crying, we're all loving, whatever. So what we do is we actually use different media to try and disrupt that, to try and put in spaces between things where people, we might lose people, people might say, oh, this doesn't look right. Um, this looks like a mistake. Yes, that's not what I want. So the, the rear screen projection effect was done by, um, recording 360 video and then putting it with um, a 3D volumetric live action video, as well as photogrammetry of a real 1986 uh, Cadillac. And that brings me to the another way that we have chosen to disrupt um, sort of normal uh, 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 boundaries and expectations, which is um, we really want to try and put history and time and process back into virtual reality, which is something that is usually effaced um, in, in making things. And so we chose photogrammetry because I really wanted to have a real object um, that had sort of was time worn put into that experience. So um, that the, the subtleties, which are not things that 
um, people in tech usually look at, um, which is, you know, what's, what is the, how does the wear of someone's um, sitting on a, on a seat over time change the way the light reflects? So that's, I, these are things that I can't predict, but I wanted to put it back into the experience. So, um, you know, we went to rural Missouri to shoot. <laughs> I was like, Cyril said, shouldn't, can we just go upstate? I was like, no, 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 something marvelous is going to happen in Missouri. It's going to change the entire way you make this experience. So we have to go to rural Missouri. So we did. Um, so, so that kind of thing. And then the, the other thing I will say is um, we scan those objects that you see are actually real archival objects that we 3D scanned. And there's rough edges on them. They don't look perfect. They don't look like they're just 3D modeled objects. And they're not. They are actually real objects that I 3D scan. And those were, you know, the pixel count was taken down. Polygon count was taken down. Um, but that's another way that we tried to disrupt, I guess it would be called glitch, um, uh, but it's very purposeful glitch, um, I would say. And then, and then the final thing, um, which I'm gonna bring up this uh, second project is really interested in um, being collaborative. Um, I, it is definitely been part of the way that we work from the beginning. Um, this idea of artistic mastery, of being like sort of the, the queen or the king of the castle is just something that I don't, I'm not interested in at all. It, it feels to me a very hierarchical way of working and I don't like to do it. So um, I, we collaborate wildly. And this project that I'm gonna talk about is the, is the, the newest project that we're doing, which is going to premiere at um, uh, uh, CPH Docs Fest at the end of April. It'll be a world in VR chat. Um, and in this project, um, what we asked, what I did was I collaborated with Louise Braganza, who's a Mumbai-based textile artist, um, and asked her to create um, unique, what I call queer skins. And these would be in between costume and clothing, not too far into costume, but close to clothing. But these, what I called soft machines, which will allow people who wear them to confront their relationship to binaries of gender, sexuality, physical form and taste um, in the process of wearing. And so we had to switch from a physical installation to photography because of COVID, um, but we did. So Louise came up with these beautiful uh, garments. I've actually never met her. We Skyped for the last year um, to make these. Uh, she's, she's in India, I'm in New York. Um, and, and had amateur models um, choose based on adjectives they were uh, asked to give of who they wanted to, uh, a part of themselves that they didn't usually show that they thought was part of themselves, and then choose a garment to wear. And I'm just going to share some of the photographs um, that came out of this, um, which I think uh, if, if um, Anna was talking about Wanda, I would talk about wonder, because I think that although I hadn't anticipated and really wanted to disrupt these binaries of gender and sexuality, I think what happened was truly magical. I think it's not even like disruptive. It just like, it goes into a space. You don't even know where you are anymore, which is really, really great. So let me just see if I can share my screen. Hold on, share screen. And yeah, I'm gonna go to the desktop. Uh, okay. Sorry, it's a little messy, but it's probably the easiest way for me to do this. Um, so these are just some of the photographs of um, that we, of the models that we came up with. Hold on. This is the only found uh, garment. It's a sort of bedraggled um, uh, piece of lingerie, which only Tomy could fit into. Um, So um, let me get out of the stop share. Okay. So this these photographs um, are just uh, sort of amazing photographs in and of themselves dealing with identity. Um, but then uh, we wanted to make a virtual exhibition. So I thought, um, 
And let me redress these photographs because, you know, it, everything the, we read aesthetics and it, it's within the hierarchies that are, you know, predominantly whale, white, male, uh, heteronormative. So let's, let me use that code and let me just mess with it a little bit. <laughs> so um, I'm going to finish by just showing you, this is a prototype, not anywhere near where it's going to be uh, in the next month. But um, the idea I have for exhibition is virtually to um, put people into an environment which are um, populated um, with differently scaled edifices, kind of a Potemkin vi village of um, archetypal architectures um, in which these um, photographs are housed. So I'm just going to show you an example. Um, and then the photograph is then again redressed with um, a, a wallpaper, which is a very domestic sort of form of um, window dressing. So let me just uh, pull up, if I can, this screen share. Let's see. Share screen. And oh, here we go. Okay. Where is it? Oh, here. There's no sound, nothing in here right now. Um, so here, as you uh, go up the steps, um, you're at the Pantheon in Rome, which is actually a Flickr Creative Commons photograph that I grabbed. Um, and this is, uh, again, playing a little bit actually on, I realized later, uh, Duchamp's Etant Donné, where you have a, a kind of view through this window of this sort of, uh, male figure and then you walk into the space um, and this is you can't actually appreciate how monumental this photograph is um, it is massive when you're actually up close to it um, so uh, you'll basically be in this um, very strange uh, village uh, where you get to contemplate these photographs and your relationship to all the codes okay let me stop the share Okay, um, so uh, that is our next project. Um, and um, again, just to reiterate, trying to come up with disruptions of the procedural logic um, as, as much as content, I would say, is, is what we're trying to get at here. And, and you know, virtual reality uh, is, is a place where we can do that. The other part about that project is it's social. Um, and you will actually be able to wear an avatar that is wearing one of those garments. So you become de facto a performer in that space and have to confront your own relationship to those garments and then being seen in those garments, um, what that means to you. So, um, yeah, that's, um, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm really, um, I'm really looking forward to see your new works. Um, so, uh, Rosalind, would you like to uh, tell us a bit about um, how you see your work as affirmative? Yes, I would. Thank you. Um, I'm so, I'm so happy to be here, and thank you so much for inviting me. Really, really happy to be in conversation with Anna and Ilya. And just so that we can think and talk together, because honestly, there are so many resonances, but also so many questions that I want to ask each of them. Um, and it just seems as if there's never been a more important time to be engaging with affirmative feminism in this moment of what we call here doom, gloom and zoom. Um, in the midst of this global pandemic in which so many people have died, so many others have suffered. And here in the UK, more than 125,000 people have died. We're currently in our, our third complete lockdown. Nearly a million people have lost their jobs. There's a, a mental health catastrophe that's um, absolutely brewing and being reported every day. And it's a moment where we can see that experiences of this pandemic and of the lockdowns have been shaped by multiple and egregious intersectional inequalities. And women are among those who've borne the brunt of the pandemic in many ways, particularly poor women, disabled women, older women, women of color, through their roles as the majority of key workers in health and social care, as the people most affected by school and nursery closures, as the workers who've been most likely to have lost their jobs during the pandemic, and through the spiraling rates of violence against women, which has been called the shadow pandemic. 
And in the last week, we've also seen here the devastating murder of a 33 year old woman, Sarah Everard, as she walked home from a friend's house in South London at 9.30 p.m. And it's a killing that has provoked an outpouring of grief and rage here. And it's spiked, sparked vigils and protests despite the lockdown. And the policing of those vigils and protests has itself added to the sense of injury that so many women are feeling. And it felt really important to say, say something about that very briefly before going on to speak about the affirmative, because this is the moment that we're living in. So in, in the wake of, of this, oh, thank you for showing that. Um, I need to somehow, um, in the wake of this, we need um, an affirmative feminist politics but what, what is this? What does it look like? And what does it look like specifically in relation to questions of representations and aesthetics? Um, so how can we, to paraphrase the invitation of this panel, go beyond lamentation and critique of the status quo to put in place feminist alternatives and possible futures? And I find myself really ambivalent in addressing this question. And in fact, when we had a, a pre panel chat it was wonderful to talk with Anna and and have the sense that both of us felt that we had a slight sort of guilty secret that we weren't quite affirmative enough in our research I hope you don't mind me sharing that Anna um, but I feel that you know all of my work as a researcher and a writer as a teacher as an activist over many decades all of this work has been animated by questions about power and questions about inequality, questions about social justice. And the idea of a better world, another world, another world is possible, is just absolutely central to everything I do and everything I am. Yet, I don't necessarily identify as an affirmative feminist. In fact, I might be understood as the opposite. I might be understood as someone whose work is actually above all else, attentive to the way that power mutates, that, for example, racism, sexism and homophobia can change to take on new forms in, re in response to um, rage and critique, um, the way that opposition can be commodified, can be appropriated, and then can be used back against us. So I think I've often found myself in the position of what Sarah Ahmed calls the feminist killjoy. And it's left me wondering, and this is just a question I'm kind of putting out there for, for everyone who's here, is whether the affirmative feminist and the killjoy are somehow in opposition or whether there's actually space for both. So one thing I think, and this really, I think resonates with what both Ilya and Anna have said is that affirmative feminism can't mean just being positive. Um, that, you know, we're living in a moment where positivity imperatives are absolutely everywhere. We're constantly being told to be bold, to be resilient, to be grateful, to be happy to dance like nobody's watching, to lean in, to be kind, to be mindful, to be calm, to dare greatly. And for me, all these positivity messages, um, so many of them corporate neoliberal messages, they're not affirming, they're silencing and they're disciplining because they're trying to shape a subject who works on herself, who represses her emotions, who tidies up negative feelings, who's always upbeat. And over the last few months, I've been interviewing young women and non-binary people. And this compulsory positivity was one of the things that they told me most got them down. They said they feel pressured, particularly on their social media, to constantly present themselves in a very positive way and present themselves as fun, happy, cool people, no matter how they actually feel, and to constantly be sort of sharing images of themselves, living their best lives. Um, and when I asked them about their, their social media, they, they talked repeatedly about, you know, I can only show the highlights reel and, um, you know, this sort of sense of editing the self online. And so it definitely can't be that kind of positivity. Um, 
back in the 1980s, when I first became involved in feminist activism, there was a kind, a kind of different kind of feminist aesthetics, and it was repeated calls for positive images of women, um, which is something that Anna's already spoken about today. Um, images that weren't shaped by the cultural imaginary of whiteness, of youth, of health, of thinness, of beauty. And it was important, and of course it remains so, to challenge dominant representations and to open up and expand the possibilities of who we are and who we can be, but not in a way that simply instills another set of images that are deemed to be more politically acceptable or treats these things as if they're rigid, fixed, static. And, you know, one feminist's positive image is something that can be enraging to another. Over the last week since Sarah Everard's murder, numerous feminists have rightly been interrogating the way that it's only now after the murder of a white, cisgender, middle-class, educated, professional, beautiful and blonde woman that violence against woman, women has received the attention that it's due in mainstream, mainstream media. It's as if she is the perfect victim. And there are really important questions to be asked about what Judith Butler calls, um, what is a grievable life? Whose lives are valued such that mainstream media pays attention only now after shamefully ignoring murders of sex workers, the murders of women of color, the murders of people that don't fit their ideal image. And there are questions too about what makes a positive image and that um, image that Emily kindly showed um, is an image of uh, taken from a vigil or protest last Saturday. Um, and it's been a galvanizing and really powerful image that's been shared millions of times on social media over the last week. But it's not in any sense simply a positive image. We can't sort of speak about it as a positive image. It's a, an image of a woman being held down by two police officers at a vigil to mark and protest the murder of another woman by a police officer. There's nothing in the image itself perhaps that makes it affirmative. I think that, that everything about the, the reason why this image has become so galvanizing is because of the context. Um, maybe there are some formal features of the fact that she holds her head up defiantly even whilst on the ground, that her eyes are open, that are uh, intrinsic to that. But I think that context is absolutely crucial in reading images. And of course, you can't just replace negative images of women with affirmative ones as if you could just go to a library of feminist images and just pick out an approved image. And in fact, that's exactly what Sheryl Sandberg, the, ed the author of Lean In, has tried to do with her Lean In collection on Getty Images, um, uh, substituting the, the existing images of women for a kind of set of other you know more corporate women in the workplace kinds of images that she thinks are um, more resonant to um, her idea of a lean-in kind of feminism um, and these have been you know roundly criticized for their whiteness their corporateness um, we know also how easily uh, alternative images can be appropriated we've seen it in the way that brands present us now with their supposedly woke credentials all the time suddenly their ambassadors for lgbtq pride last summer they all became uh pro black lives matter and changed their branding and marketing campaigns we've just had international women's day we've seen lots and lots of supposedly um positive branded images around feminism when it suits them appropriating value from these movements, but in doing so, emptying them of their politics. So I've tried to be thinking about, well, what affirmative possibilities might there be in representations? And obviously, I think this is something we can talk about collectively, but we've all experienced those exhilarating, intoxicating moments when we've been watching and listening to something on screen music, resistance, solidarity. It's never 
for me anyway, just a flat image. It's always embedded in a narrative. Um, it's often Im embedded in a genre. There's like way too much to say in my 10 minutes, but I think that um, some key principles are around inclusivity and diversity um, in somehow pointing up the structural and institutional and systemic forces that um, are involved in oppression, um, in displaying solidarity and as Ilya was talking about, in, in this kind of idea of agency and disruption and opening up spaces to imagine a different way of living and being. And I'll just end with one example um, that Shani Orgad, who I've been writing with for, for many years now, um, and I used in our book, The Confidence Cult, which is coming out later this year, and what this book does is, um, is it explores the way that confidence is being promoted, like relentlessly promoted as a kind of panacea for all women's ills. So we look across different domains. We look at um, the workplace and we look at how, you know, inequalities in the workplace are explained away as if they're the result of a lack of confidence on women's part rather than institutional sexism within different workplaces. We look at advertising that tries to instill love your body messages or be comfortable in your own skin. We look at self-help. We look at sex and relationship advice, look at motherhood self-help. We look at development campaigns. We look across like a, a number of different domains. Um, and we are, this is a critique. It's not affirmative. It is a critique. Um, and it's a critique of the way that this confidence discourse individualizes, psychologizes, ends up blaming women like gender injustice is something we just do to ourselves. But at the end of the book, we ask ourselves, well, what spaces are there, even in the mainstream, that do do something different, that do go beyond um, this kind of individualizing, psychologizing, blaming discourse? And we discuss a few different examples. And one of the examples that we discuss is a key scene in the Netflix series Sex Education, which is set in a, and interestingly, it's um, in a fictional school, but interestingly, it's a lot has been said about the kind of hyper reality of this school and the, the, the same sorts of things that Ilya and Anna have both talked about, about the saturation of the colors um, and the hyper reality. Um, it's set in this school, it presents intimate relationships in an open and nuanced way. It's sensitive to multiple complexities and differences as they cross cut class, race, sexual orientation, gender identity. The show is really outstanding because it's bold, it's sex positive. It allows audiences to identify across multiple characters, not just a single point of view. And although bodily embarrassment and bodily shame are repeated motifs in the series and thus they could easily lend themselves to precisely the individualized love your body messages that um, we critique. The show deliberately resists this and the one minute extract that I want to show you is when the school assembly resists a slut shaming dynamic of um, a girl called Ruby after a sext of her has been shared around the school. It might not have the same meaning seeing the show, but for Shani and I and millions of others, it became um, a very affirmative moment as person after person resists the head teacher's attempts to shame a Ruby in a joyous and collective moment of refusal. And I definitely see this as affirmative. <laughs> No. It's my vagina. Sit down. No, that is my vagina in the photo. Sit down. No, it's my vagina. No. Thank you, Maeve. Settle down, please. You're both wrong. It's my vagina. It, it cannot be all your vaginas. I also have a vagina. Well, congratulations. Please sit down. It's my vagina. It's my vagina. Oh, enough. It's my vagina. 
It's Thank my you. vagina. I understand what you are all it trying to say. It is my say. vagina. You don't have a vagina. You do not have a vagina in the same way that I do not have a vagina. It's my vagina. Please, would you all just it's sit my down? It is required vagina. that you... It's my vagina. 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 Thank, thanks for that, Emily. And um, that's me done. <laughs> Thank you. I love this example. I think it was when I saw it as well on the show, that's what I thought that this is a very affirmative moment. And um, your um, thank you all for your for your uh, presentations and um, and and your the the reflections that you've um, you've brought up, um, Rosalind, towards the end here um, or well during your, your presentation. Uh, really got me thinking how um, difficult this affirmative uh, concept is, um, because um, when I when I researched it, it's certainly not positivity that I meant, um, and it's not an absence of critique either. It's something that is uh, that stems from critique. So it's a disruption, a political disruption that stems from critique, but that actually proposes uh, an alternative, or that has a kind of and, and I think like the, the raised head of the women on the ground, even in the context that she is, is, is actually kind of a, a small, um, even if it's small affirmative gesture, even if it is uh, within this um, atrocious um, context. Um, so I, I really, I really like this, uh, this provocation um, and, and this idea of uh, is, is uh, the, the feminist killjoy an uh, opposition to the affirmative? And I'd, I'd like to hear from you about this, uh, if you are all um, familiar with the concept of the feminist uh, killjoy, but I don't, um, I, I don't see it as a, in a position. I actually see the feminist killjoy as a very affirmative, um, affirmative um, figure in the sense that the feminist killjoy will, um, will not stay quiet and and will say um will say out loud what um what is wrong with um with inequalities and with um um and and with um uh, political issues so i think it is a very affirmative figure in itself um but is it because it it does um offer critiques while speaking up um, I don't know if you you want to talk about this uh, figure a bit more, Ilya or Anna. Maybe do you, if you have any um, suggestion towards this, maybe um, maybe this debate between positivity and affirmative, um, which I, I think well, it's not really a debate. I think it is for for me. It is very different, but I completely. Um, yeah, it, it it could be it could become kind of merged or falsely merged, and and it is a slippery terrain in a way. So I um uh, you know VR is uh, problematic in the sense that it um it makes you because of its uh, sense of presence really makes you feel like you are there. So I um there's uh, what I, there's a sort of genre of experience in VR, which I call virtual absolution experiences, which is where you get to pretend to be a black person, or you can pretend to be, I don't know, a disabled person. And, and, or you can pretend that you are, um, you know, rescuing a little girl who's, you know, trapped under rubble in a Syrian bombed out town. And you can go through those experiences and so, and, and think to yourself, oh, I got it. I know what it's like. But the fact of the matter is, is that when you get out of headset, you're still gonna be black or not. You're gonna be a woman or not. And you have to deal with the political, social and cultural realities of that. So I don't, um, and maybe I'm just not a good good enough filmmaker to take that on. Let's put it that way. So I I actually want to create experiences that are impossible in real life, where where you don't have. It's not about living the best life. It's about living an other life where I I don't have any more clue as to the right way to go about this than you do. As a, and 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 that includes 
straight white men. Like they don't know either. And, and suddenly we're all put in a position of not knowing what is the correct way to go through this? What is the right way to go through this? And in that openness, maybe find another way of interacting with others or another way of approaching things. And, and just to, Rosalind mentioned Sarah Ahmed, and I have to say that her book, Queer Phenomenology, has been just so, so, such an inspiration for me. It was like I was reading my own mind. I mean, she has this amazing uh, quote, I'll just sort of paraphrase, where she says, um, it is possible to create different spaces where the objects which seem distant to us, the people that seem distant to us um, can actually be brought closer. And this idea of queerness and straightness, straightness being on a path where certain things are in your path and the things that are deviant are outside of your path and would require that. I wanna put those things in your path. I wanna create spaces where there's other ways of looking at people, at, at, at being in the world, not, and again, that's in a way not, both recognizing and not recognizing the sort of binaries and hierarchies. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely, uh, I completely see this in in VR as well as you said of 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 putting you in a different skin or in a different, uh, but at the same time not being completely disruptive or, or being hard. Yeah, or it is very hard to. Well, it, it is very hard to know what is the long-term impact of, of those experiences, right? But as you say, it's it's a matter of bringing in into view or bringing a different um, a different um, um, idea on your path in a way, right? Um, I don't know if Anna, you're inspired uh, of uh, talking towards this uh, affirmativity or positivity or um, or what is what is affirmative in a critical kind of way. Um, well, I've, I've read your book, Maud, and I, would yeah. agree. I don't think that there is um, a contradistinction between um, feminist killjoys and affirmative feminism in the sense of affirmative feminism could be what I've taken wonder to be, for instance, as a, a work of art that opens up a site of contestation in which kind of socio-symbolic structures, particularly ones that have to do with the way in which we live our lives as gendered subjectivities, are thrown radically into question. And what would it mean to do that through a kind of aesthetics of, or negative aesthetics, I guess, because my central contention about wonder really, or my cardinal understanding or the thing I'm connected to in it is actually her depression. And the way in which depression as a kind of somatic experience, the way in which it can be expressed bodily on screen, can convey all sorts of inequities to do with kind of social and political structures, the way in which women particularly, um, you know, I mean, this, this film centres particularly on working class experience, but are oppressed, are not seen, are discarded. But I think in a contemporary context, something that um, Rosalind said really resonated with, with me about the way in which I think essentially women in popular con or contemporary culture now are asked to act as containers for so many things in society. And that fundamentally, I think the role of women socially and politically as a container is so often to smooth over things and to make things okay. And that's why we see this embodied in sort of the can-do girl, which I've spoken about in terms of um, Lena Dunham's girls, which I think was roundly pilloried because it seemed like she was saying what well, feminism is about essentially what could be conceived of as post-feminism. But I actually saw the series as a really, really vehement critique of popular contemporary neoliberal feminism that essentially if this brand, because it literally is a brand of feminism, does not work for the very demographic it's aimed at, if this is summoning a form of sort of slow death or attrition upon these women who are aspiring to uphold everything and be everything in society and be a container for all, all the ills of society and answer to all these things. Really, who is feminism working for? 
And I think that I can see a direct line between the work of, you know, I've worked on very disparate filmmakers. So like I've written a book on Sofia Coppola, um, you know, I've written a book on Loddon. I'm now writing a book on Picnic at Hanging Rock, looking at the way in which, you know, the women in that film are imaged and what that tells us about the male imaginary. But I see a direct line between all of these things. And I think it has to do with women being used as a container as having to kind of present everything as smooth and beautiful and fundamentally okay and all right. And that disrupting that, putting a cog in the wheel of that system is for me an act of affirmative feminism, but it comes in the form of very, very stringent critique. So I, I see my role as a feminist scholar as being somebody who is a cultural critic. And I think the joy of being a scholar and for instance, not a film critic is that we have the luxury of being able to think about things at length. You know, I think critics are paid to have an opinion in the next five minutes and that often doesn't work out so well for them. But we have, we have the luxury of being able to take our time and think about things and join the dots. And, and so I think, that's one thing I wanted to say about this. But the other thing I would say about was the idea of solidarity, because I do also have those very kind of emotional, visceral reactions to moments of feminist solidarity. And I certainly got a lump in my throat listening to all those women chanting, you know, in Clapham. And, you know, and I wished coming from London and particularly kind of that area of London in a way that, you know, I was there too. But I think there's also another side of feminism where the imperative for solidarity and positivity kind of elides or rejects the notion that there is also a, a great deal of um there's a dark side to feminism i was thinking about joe freeman's article on trashing you know that i think that was written in the 70s i can't remember but there has always been this strain of exclusion you know even with feminism if you're not doing it right you're not included. Um, and I find I find that aspect of contemporary feminism right now, which I think has always been present. It's always been about who gets to be a feminist and who doesn't. The sort of gatekeeping around it, I can't stand. Let me put it that way. So I think that's those are some things that have come up in response to what's been shared after the talks. I really like this idea of what you um, um, what you you said about or what you presented here, and also in terms of um, your analysis of wonder of how this negativity um, is becoming, in fact, a kind of an affirmative politics in a way. Or I don't know if I if I read that well, but in in what I understand uh, what you're saying, right? It's um, it, it's it's not it may not be kind of the affirmativeness might not be directly present in the um, in the image itself, but it, it does come out from uh, from the the intention. Is that is that what? Um... Well, it's I mean, it's curious to me. There's been a lot written on Wanda, despite the fact that um, it was quite poorly distributed after its release and, and it's kind of gone in and out of visibility um, and was nearly actually chucked into a bin at the print of it. Um, which was actually under the name of the producer and not under Barbara Lodden's name, the, the canister of film. But anyway, I, one of the curious things about it is that, you know, I've sort of obviously read a lot of, of that literature around it, is the construction of her as, um, A, as Barbara Lodden herself, which is completely incorrect, but that's another issue. But the passivity that she is sort of this redundant figure almost, or a kind of holding space or negative space. But the more that I looked at Barbara Lodden's performance, you can actually see that the passivity is sort of a tool that she's using in a way to very sadly have to ingratiate herself in the lives of really pathetic, abusive men, because this is her best chance of survival in this particular moment that the film stages. But the, in essence, there's something very active in her passivity. And I think that there's a, there's a critique there in a the sense of that a woman will use whatever is available to her 
And if those resources are dwindling, then maybe the only thing she has to play on is her femininity. And I can see that the film was very problematic within a second wave feminist context for that reason, because this was not a message that any woman wanted to hear at the height of kind of, you know, empowerment and sisterhood. But I think that Wonder contains the kernel of every criticism of kind of contemporary feminism. That's why I think it speaks so presciently to our political moment, not just about kind of inequities in society, but also who gets to be included in feminism, who is feminism actually working for? Um, so, and I think it's, I mean, it's there in the film's aesthetics, but it's also there in Lodgen's performance. Um, well, I think it's interesting. I mean, I don't know that I would be, I mean, I don't know that our work is considered feminist, although I really consider it feminist. And I think that, um, I mean, because I think that, I mean, and maybe this is wrong, but I think that that women, because of our relationship to power, are, are better or, or more likely to take up the opportunities that I present. Um, my hope is that, uh, you know, uh, well, <laughs> my hope is that that you know white straight men will also take see those opportunities, um, and and that's one of the things that you see in that um, in the last photograph that I showed. That guy is actually white and straight, and we made a circumstance where he. I just surprised. I was shocked. He's a friend of mine. I was shocked that he decided to wear that penis dress, but it gave him an opportunity to explore some part of himself in a way that I, you know, I mean, wow, it just, it, it opened up that possibility. So it's not, I guess my work could not be read as, how, how do I put it? Like the idea that, I mean, am, I think it's very feminist work, but I don't think on the surface that people would necessarily consider it to be so. I mean maybe i don't know maybe maud you know you know my work <laughs> or is it feminist yeah, i no I, I definitely yeah i definitely consider your work as feminist uh i i really wonder what makes you what what makes you doubt it it's that would be very interesting for me to hear <laughs> no i just think that it's what it's what anna was talking about is the idea that who who counts what kind of techniques count as feminist techniques is this is this something that counts as a feminist technique? And 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 that is, she's she's absolutely right in saying that there are these points of exclusion where you can be a certain kind of feminist and not and and where is that where is the boundary where that's not recognized as feminist? And I think that that's actually where the whole question of the killjoy versus the affirmist feminist feminist comes up because maybe we're excluding in bringing those two binaries about, maybe we're excluding other forms of feminism that we're not even recognizing as feminism. So I would just put that out there. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it is. It comes from the very the the very heterogeneity of uh, of feminism, right? That feminism has never had, is, is really in the plural. It has never been uh, a, a kind of very singular definition. Um, but for me, everything that disrupts structures of um, of power and and of um, and of roles role models and binary role models that um, that we need to follow is is a kind of feminist uh, critique. But I don't know, Anna, you wanted to. I I just I think I just want to say that I think that feminism is both Juliet Mitchell's conception of the longest revolution. And it is also a conversation without end. And it needs to be all of those things. And the conflict needs to be kept alive because also that is the only way to affect change, to bring real change about. And I think the thing that upsets me mostly about the state of feminism right now is that we are more intent on deciding who gets to be a feminist, who gets to be included in the little group, rather than actually recognizing that we cannot afford to exclude anyone from this because the thing is that misogyny is running rampant right now and male sexualized violence against women is you know at a peak level um so i i find the sort of um 
the debates around what counts as feminism in a way. I think I can quite simply say I don't think post-feminism or neoliberal feminism or Twitter feminism or whatever you want to call it counts. I can quite safely say that does not come into the equation of what I think feminism looks like. But I think just politically, you know, we need we need to get our teeth back. <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> So Ro Rosalind, maybe you have uh, something to say about conflict <laughs> or I don't know, you've kept very quiet. So I'm, I'm sure you have taken a lot of notes that you would like to share with us. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, yeah, there's, I've got so many ideas and I'm also reading some amazing things that are coming in on the chat. Loads of people are, are talking about, um, talking about this in the chat, but yeah, so many things to say, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I do. I love that idea of of um, a kind of conversation and contestation, and that uh, you know this because I think it's an idea of something that's really open and inclusive, um, but also unending. And yeah, I think that's a really important way of thinking about feminism, rather than there being sort of one pure way. Um, I think I'm really struck by. Um, like in this conversation about, you know, because I, I sort of introduced myself saying I felt I was, you know, almost like a little bit of a failure as, a, as an affirmative feminist, and maybe I wasn't affirmative enough and I was too critical. And yet what I'm kind of hearing in the discussion is so much that is about actually about critique and maybe we are, maybe we're moving beyond that binary of kind of critique versus affirmation, because um, I'm, the words that I'm hearing so much from all of us really are around discomfort and critique and disruption and allowing space and, and you know, disrupting binaries and opening up possibilities. And these all feel like words that I'm familiar with and very happy to use um, about my own work, but they don't feel like a sort of, they don't feel like imagining another world. They feel like disrupting the world that we're in and critiquing it. Um, yeah, I, I completely, I completely agree with this, uh, with this idea of not uh, not bringing something completely new, but rather, as we said before, in terms of um, that was related also with that Sarah Ahmed work uh, works is like bringing uh, bringing new uh, opportunities into view and bringing all the models that have been erased from history, basically uh, bringing them back, um, bringing them back into view, so that we could. Um, adopt different models. Um, uh, maybe we can um, maybe we can have a question and then uh, we can have a short break um, and then come back. So Emily, do you want to share first question? Yeah, there's a question uh, in the Q&A from Kirthana um, to Rosalind. Uh, so they say identity crisis and precarity were two major issues I faced in my media job. And after I started reading your works, especially inequalities in media work, I was able to take a stand for myself. You demystified many power dominations and I and many other women in my workplace was, was subjected with. Bound by wages and fame, I kept myself mystified for over a decade, the results of which I am still experiencing. Uh, my long time inquisitiveness was about the psychological effects that the victims go through. Oh, sorry, and it's Sithara, yeah, um, was the name of the person who's just commented, so maybe. Yeah, oh, thanks so much for that, that comment, and that's really, 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 I really, really appreciate it, and I do think, yeah, that is, again, it goes back to this question of sort of what it means to be affirmative, and I really like the way that you've said that in a way that was really really important for you to have your experience demystified to have somebody that um sort of like understood you, your experience as somebody who was very precarious working in a media job um and to, to have that understood and 
almost like affirmed, like to, just to have the reality, like recognized. I do think that's such an important thing. And, um, you know, just, just to be seen, to be heard, to have your experiences heard and recognized um, is so important. And it picks up on something that Anna said earlier. Um, I, well, I wrote down, this might not be exactly what you um, said, but you wrote down about the refusal to see can itself be an act of violence. And I think that's, that's yeah, re a really, really important point. Um, I think there is a hand uh, raised as well. Maybe we can um, take that question and then go back to all the all the questions that are in the chat because there is a lot of uh, interactions and Q and A's. Yeah, so uh, Mary had a question that she'd like to ask. Mary, are you back from the break yet? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for giving me. Um first question and thank you all so much for such great talks i really like the structure of this event um you know with people coming from slightly different perspectives on this one question it's brilliant i wanted to ask a question about the, the recurrent theme of hyper realism um mentioned by all of you to some extent um i was really interested that that went across the papers because i've been working on on genre films by women in hollywood and i'm trying to think about uh moving away from a historical tendency to want to exclude women from the mainstream, which can lead to an impasse um, and films where instead they're exaggerating genre conventions such that these conventions are in a way denaturalized, yet they're still affectively powerful and through reference to conventional connotations. Because like Rosalind, I think you can't really get away from context, even when you're just trying to do analysis of an image, you know, there's always some context. Um, so I just wondered really if you were, were able to say any more about that. I'm really interested if you're thinking about um, hyperrealism as a route to uh, emotional connection um, and, you know, just to, it'd be good if you maybe you'd like to talk to each other about it, given that it came up. So thank you. Um, I, I, you know, I, are you, have you looked at the work of Karen Sider? C-Y-T-T-E-R, she's an Israeli artist, filmmaker. No. Uh, oh, definitely, you can find a bunch of her work on Vimeo. Um, she is about the most wonderful uh, artists manipulating genre. I, I, I think you will, I, I, if I could get anywhere close to what she does, um, she really knows cinematic language and plays with it in ways that takes you to a spot where you never expected to be. And it's um, uh, emotionally uh, really impactful. So I would really suggest that you take a look at, at her work for sure. Um, I mean, for me, working with genre is just a way of setting up signposts where I can sort of seduce the film, the, the audience to come with me um, so that I can start to disrupt those expectations. So I'm, it's a, almost, a, I would say, a humane way of, of doing it, but also uh, a way for me to recognize that there are structures. It's not just like I can erase everything and go, oh, isn't it wonderful now? I actually want to put that um, the the structure uh, into this into play. Um, otherwise, I'm just making new, you know, transcendent content, which is not what I want to do because that dismisses the political, economic, and social realities. So, so that's how I think about uh, hyper realism in my work. Thank you. I think this speaks really well to what you said as well um, earlier in your talk that uh, this positionality or this in-betweenness of VR as well, of, of being always kind of um, coming from a reality, going into another, but never in either of those. And um, I think this is, for me, this was also uh, very much what attracted to me, uh, what, what attracted me uh, towards VR or AR um, because of this, uh, this in between this. Uh, so I think it is, it has a very um, uh, yeah, strong political um, uh, yeah, <laughs> way of uh, 
of yeah, of but I think we're gonna we see a lot of transcendence, uh, potential, yeah. like, and that's I think incredibly ethically problematic. I mean, that may relate also to what you know. Um, Anna and Rosalind were saying about this idea of uh, affirmative, always having to be positive, uh, positive images of women, you know, the Getty bank of images of positive women is, is, you know, about this, this kind of form of transcendence, which just effaces what the political, cultural and social realities are, which is in intensely problematic, I agree. Mm. Mm. That, to me, that brings to mind two things. Firstly, I think one of the things I'm really struck by, particularly to do with sort of contemporary feminist debate, has to do with arguing that it would be possible to think oneself or conceive of one's subjectivity or experience outside of ideology. And I just don't think that's possible. I think that's complete nonsense. But the other thing that it's bringing to mind is the dematerialization of bodies, particularly women's bodies. So I have several students last year who wrote dissertations on influences, which was a, a whole new ball game or fresh hell for me to discover. Um, but not only influences, sort of um, completely um dematerialized non-existent virtual reality cyborg women that were being used to sell products that had amassed millions of followers on instagram as i understand it and what was interesting to me was they didn't necessarily see this as a bad thing but obviously for me it you know made me come out in a a rash instantly um and and become extremely concerned about the state or the direction in which things are heading. So, and there, I think there's also, I mean, I'm interested to hear what you think about kind of the dematerialization of the body, like what digital aesthetics can do, you know, in terms of that and, and social media as well. I think that, you know, it used to be that the pernicious thing would be film images or advertising or whatever. But I think now the sort of echo ideal, if we want to think about it in psychoanalytic terms, um, is actually one's own image as airbrushed, as conceived of as a package on social media platforms, which is incredibly distressing to think about. Um, well, I think for me, um, I mean, this is something, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, uh, embodiment is something that has really become Im so important in the work that I'm doing. Um, so movement through spaces and constructing um, ways of moving through spaces, obstacles to that, um, playing with scale, f making the, the really a huge part of the agency uh, in my experiences be embodied movement is is critical. So I'll just I'm, I mean, this with our la with our second virtual reality piece called Queer Skin's Arc, um, the main scene is the mom that you saw in the first one. Uh, 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 reads her son's diary and allows herself to imagine him alive and in love. And it's um, this beautiful scene of these two men dancing together, which was shot, um, this is an, <laughs> this will bring up another issue, um, which was shot on the largest volumetric stage in the world. Somehow we convinced Intel Studios to <laughs> support this <laughs> project, two men dancing together, two lovers dancing together, great. Um, and. And in that, uh, your how you experience the dance really is determined by your own proximity, deciding whether you move closer or farther away from the dancers, and then how you move through the space. So even though you don't have a body in the space, you're you are embodied because it, your agency is is writ through your movement in that space. So I, I agree. I mean, part of this comes from my being a physician. I mean, I actually work in. Uh, a jail taking care of inmates. So I work at Rikers, which is a you know pretty notorious place. So I'm never, I am absolutely with you on that, Anna, about the effacement of bodies. Um, and and I, I take it out of my work, making it part of the procedural logic. So it's, it's everybody has to be part of it. Yeah. 
Can I come in also on the dematerialization? Um, it's su yeah, it's such, I mean, it's, I feel like I've got like such a much plainer language somehow than <laughs> you, you're using to talk about it. But I mean, just bringing it back to something really kind of mundane, I guess, but also very, very powerful. Yesterday, I was um, interviewing a, a 20 year old black woman and um, talking to her about her social media. And she was absolutely saying, um, how she feels that she's not good enough unless she's filtered and edited. And she was talking about the way that that's actually built into the platform logics that she's on, where, you know, she's on Snapchat and they're automatically asking her to change the lighting and to do certain, you know, change certain features of herself and likewise with Instagram. And um, so, yeah, I think these things are really, really fundamental. I mean, it's so interesting, again, to come back to that question about hyper-realism, because we're all in this hyper-reality, none of this, you know, and, and, you know, all of the young people that I've been interviewing have been saying, you would never, you know, you, you don't want your photos to look like they've been filtered and edited, but you would never post an unfiltered one. And so uh, the, our whole social media environments are hyper real in that sense, but we don't tend to speak about them in that vocabulary. I think I, I agree with you, Rosalind. And I think actually one of the most worrying aspects of all of this is that when, when I was at school, I remember it was, it was peer group pressure. It was, you know, people who were literally in front of you that you answered to, you know, and that that was harmful enough. But now it seems to be there is no place to escape from that. You have that kind of in the school, the social environment, but then you also have it in your pocket, on your phone, right? And the irony of that is that that's not necessarily peer group. That's also an algorithm. Like you're performing for an algorithm. I, I find that horrific. Absolutely horrific. Well, it's interesting. There is this, you know, there's a new platform called Clubhouse, which uses just vo voice. And so it is dematerialized. But on the other hand, I think that the, the nuances of voice are really interesting um, in the sense that um, so much of the paralinguistic effects are uh, nuance has is captured in voice. So I would just bring that up as maybe a response to that dematerialization um, as a possibility. I don't know. I haven't thought about it that way, but it's a great. Uh, we had um, quite a bit of questions in the in the chat to the Q and A that stayed a bit. Uh unanswered so maybe we can attend to that yeah uh, we have a question uh, that came in a while ago from deep T. Uh, how can affirmative feminism be deployed in popular cinema like Ilya said earlier it is in a way about trying to come up with disruptions of procedural logic and her use of the VR medium in the way that she does is an example of that but in places like India, VR has a limited reach. She herself says how she locates her work as between art and entertainment because it is a binary as well as art has limited reach. So at a time when media is filled with a neoliberal image of feminism with like Rosalind says, with body positive pressures and the, co the confidence culture, is it still possible to work with the kind of image language that has popular appeal now but infuse it with affirmative feminism can anybody like to i mean i can't answer to film i can say that vr is really hard to get to in india because i had to try and get an oculus quest headset to my collaborator which i eventually did but it was hard so it is um i i would just i would I would agree with you about the um, the cinema. I, I really am intent on getting into this space um, early because it's already being colonized by um, sort of white Western men. And, and, and so to the extent that I can get in there and work with companies like Intel to disrupt, um, I'm, I'm gonna do it. But I, I would just ask the other panelists for ideas about cinema 
using sort of logical procedural disruptions? Well, I think one of the, the problems that has plagued cinema and not that, I mean, I, I understand next to nothing about technology. Like I was just complaining to my wife this morning that I want to go back to a flip phone because I hate all this stuff. But um, the, in essence, that kind of code is also conceived as, as of as being neutral and objective. But we know that, you know, the apparatus of the cinema is an extension of the male gaze. We know that most of the people programming stuff are men, normally white straight men. I think, I mean, this is not new information. This is, you know, Sadie Plant has been talking about this. And, but I think that that's one, one of the problems to start with is that the very tools that you're using are based on a particular perspective and experience and understanding of the world as a neutral objective standpoint. I mean, we, we talked about on Monday in the um, pre-panel discussion about the fact that, you know, when I teach film history to my students a couple of years ago, I was petitioned to teach film history from a neutral perspective by which they meant white and male. Like, don't, don't give us a lecture on politics and kind of um, neoliberalism and Reagan and Trump. And we just want to watch Die Hard without kind of understanding if I just came in and just showed them Die Hard, A, that would make my job very easy, but that in and of itself would be very ideological. So I think there's something to do with also having to disrupt the tools with which you are working. I mean, there's that famous Audrey Lord quote that everybody uses everywhere all the time now um, about the master's tools and the master's house. But, you know, I think that there is something in that, particularly if you are doing work that is kind of on the margins, but is pertaining to be part of kind of a very big industry that is male dominated. So I think it starts, it starts with the tools, which was why I was talking about kind of critique at the level of the image that we can't be so naive as to assume that the tools are working with are objective and what we capture is objective reality. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to come in on that as well. And I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I really appreciate your point, Anna, about the apparatus of cinema and also the apparatus of the algorithm and, and the tools as apparatuses as well that are, you know, created by particular powerful groups in particular moments. I'm so, um, I kind of come back to Deep T's question about um, kind of film and I'm not a film scholar, but um, I'm, I'm really interested in the mainstream. I'm really interested in, in just, you know, mainstream television. And I think there's some amazing, you know, been some amazing things that I've just been watching even during <laughs> the lockdown. I mean, watching a lot of TV, like most people during this period. Um, and I would really like, you know, highlight I May Destroy You as something absolutely amazing. I don't know if it's affirmative, um, but it's certainly powerful, disruptive, brings perspectives that just haven't been seen enough on television. It's a Sin is another thing I've watched that's been absolutely incredible, um, set in the 80s. Um, talking about HIV and AIDS crisis then. Um, Unbelievable was a really, really interesting program for, um, you know, that you could see as kind of post Me Too television um, that was all about how difficult it is for women to be believed when they bring up uh, allegations of sexual violence. So I think there are loads of really interesting things in the mainstream um, that are, I don't know if they're affirmative because I'm still not sure whether we can use that word or I can comfortably inhabit that word, but are definitely interesting and kind of like moving our conversations forward. Uh, yeah, I do agree that there is a lot of um, there is a lot of uh, coming uh, things coming up in the mainstream as well and in um, and in popular television. And uh, I, I do think I do think that I may destroy you is affirmative um, in, in the way that it really um, it really reclaims the, the narrative um, or 
it, it is about it is about reclaiming the narrative, isn't it? Um, and um, I, I think there was a there was a, a question to that um, to to that uh, intent in uh, in the Q and A. Uh, about the role that, uh, so it's Elisa asking the question about the role that VR plays in representation um, and uh, how to uh, articulate the opportunity that VR gives in terms of self-construction or identity um, compared to the mainstream uh, representation. And yeah, is there an opportunity that results in feminism or, um, or identity not being as dependent on representation? Um, I, I don't know if Elia, you want to talk to this or? Um, yeah, I think that, uh, well, I would just, I'm going to bring this up and is I think it has to do with the dematerialization that we talked about, but also about constructing identities in virtual spaces. So identities um, on, on social platforms and virtual spaces. So that would be like Altspace VR. Uh, Facebook has a thing called Horizons, which I've never been on. Um, and then we have VR chat. Um, so you essentially until unless you're uh, oh and then mozilla hubs also i mean you can you can hack your own avatars but if for the most part people are using what's available to them um <clears throat> so uh it, i would love to see a scholar actually go into this space and and deconstruct how the identities are being colonized with the same damn stuff we see right now because um once microsoft bought bought Altspace VR, you used to be able to be a robot. And I I loved that. I loved being able to be a robot. That was sort of, you could make it gender neutral. You could be a female robot or a male robot, but you were still a robot. You could be this like little bee creature. When Altspace, when Microsoft bought Altspace VR, you couldn't do that anymore. You had to be human. But, but it was like, as if this human was somehow more natural. <laughs> <laughs> robot I don't I didn't really understand but it's like and then you could choose your skin color right so it's essentially reinforcing all of the things that were that we determine ourselves to be which is maybe you don't want to do that but you were not given actually another choice and it's I I call it like the pottery barn of 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 VR it's like you can be whatever you want to be but essentially in the bottom line is you're you're white <laughs> <laughs> like you're a black white or you're a white white you're just like there's like nothing else there's no i mean i actually love the wild west of vr chat even though it's populated by 12 year olds because you can be a stick of butter with an arrow through its head and what the hell does that mean i mean imagine meeting your colleagues in 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 vr chat where you get to be like a i love my favorite is being a donut man where i'm huge and sweet and soft and who doesn't love a donut man but honestly i feel different when i walk into a space i feel big i feel powerful and i'm a donut man i mean it is for me it is a wonderfully playful thing but again it's in normal life it's constricted right so now we're actually seeing colonization of identity by avatars in vr A lot of my um, a lot of my female students are gamers, although they don't call themselves that because I think they sort of it's funny. There seems to be a hierarchy between you know who gets to be a serious gamer and who doesn't. But um, a lot of them were telling me that they never ever present online as young women, never because that's just automatically an invitation to abuse. Um, there was a, I wonder how this, uh, this um, uh, embodiment of a different avatar kind of speaks to the hyper realism or to a materi materialization in a way. And uh, Miriam de Rosa had a comment. I don't know if she wants to share it already or I can uh, just read it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, that. yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi, <everybody. laughs> Yeah, no, it was just 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 a quickie relay um, regarding Clubhouse, which I also don't use a lot uh, because I basically don't like it. But it was really, really interesting to see how hierarchical the whole situation is, even though you don't have images. And yet there is, you know, this room space. So automatically you can totally visualize that and you can even more visualize that because there are different floors 
of this of these rooms where you know the up floor where the organizers of the room are and those that enter the room quickly or i don't know at the privilege to get there get to the chance to talk uh and then there are uh like the bottom floor where you only are allowed to listen so in that sense of course you don't have the image of a body but the voice is very much standing for you know a very sort of um clear situation and and power relation there and to me it's very much kind of um symptom of uh being allowed to to be and to inhabit that virtual world so in a way because we were talking about materialization of um of bodies um and dematerialization of bodies obviously there's the question whether you're allowed or not to materialize yourself so that that was it really I don't know if uh, someone I, I'm actually not familiar with Clubhouse, but I don't know if uh, Ilya, you you talked about this or I, I, I it's not something I use a lot either. Um, it makes me feel um, very uh, self conscious. Um, and also, uh, so I, I, I think it's the, what I would just point out is how and this is something that that Anna was talking about how the 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 apps are structured um is how you get to interact so this idea of not even having a voice literally in this app if you're not one of the higher ups is um is really fascinating to me i will just bring up and again i don't have enough to know about that it was at least at the beginning um very populated um by black voices and it was um thought to be very it was thought to be problematic by the people who started it because they thought that white people would not feel welcome in that space i think it may have started to change because white people tend to go and populate whatever they think they is the cool thing um but it, at first it was actually this space for black voices to be heard and to talk to each other I think it, it 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 speaks again about um about how we are we have to be given space or we have to take space right and or opening different uh, spaces and I think Anna you also mentioned uh, mentioned this um, and um, yeah I I wonder if you can um, talk a bit more about this idea of um, of our space um, yeah of space in terms of power relations. Um, I was struck by something that um, Ilya said about um, art being a potentially liminal space. And um, I wondered if you could speak more about that in relation to um, also art that pertains to virtual reality um, being a liminal space, whether that, I mean, that can be a site of contestation, but it can also be a site that's co-opted as well. And all too often, it does seem to be by particularly white men, I think, kind of to colonize virtual space as well. Um, so I, I wondered if you had, I, I just wanted to hear more about kind of your, your thoughts on, on art as a liminal space. Yeah, I actually was wondering about this as well, about this position to negotiate that you mentioned. Um, I've gotten some pushback about, um, it's interesting, again, it goes, speaks to uh, what, what Rosalind was saying about, you know, you know, the having sort of uh, positive feminism versus, you know, being the, the killjoy feminist, like, um, I've had, you know, I've had women say to me, oh, I don't know why you're, why you're, you know, you know, basically in bed with corporations and, 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 you know, why don't you, why don't you choose the pure realm of like, you know, being, um accessible and I, I was i i completely i understand that point of view but on the other hand i'm i am not interested in being the um sort of in the pure ivory tower realm where i can just like be the artist i want i want to be i want to if i'm going to be powerful i want to disrupt within those power relations so if if intel gives me a deal and has weirdly makes no artistic demands on me i why would 
why wouldn't I do that? Like, why? Somehow that's thought to be like, not okay, because I'm a woman. I don't, I don't get that. I don't get. And it, I find that that's a kind of weird shaming that goes on. I'm not, I, you know, if, if Intel had said, you can't, do x y and z then then i would have had to decide whether it was worth it or not but in the end they didn't ask me to do anything differently than i wanted to do so why wouldn't i put myself in a position of power i don't uh, that is really problematic and yes the the spaces are already corporatized and and the fact that we even got into that space is um is kind of remarkable i mean I will just say that ARC has not been released on Steam, which is the most popular platform for releasing um, VR content. We can't actually figure out why they won't let us release it, but they won't. I mean, you can get it on Viveport, but you can't get it on Steam. So we're, we're limited because that platform just decided that we were not acceptable for releasing on their platform and we can't get an answer out of them. That's, that's reminding me of something um, in this, book by Anne, I think her surname is pronounced Snitoff, but I couldn't be sure, but it's called The Feminism of Uncertainty, and she talks about particularly feminist academics, and she says that we are the most brilliant of survivors in a tottering system, and I think there is something about if you are doing feminist work, you are both, you have to be by nature both inside and outside of the system, like to try and do that work completely outside of the system, is incredibly hard labor and risks invisibility which is why it's so important that the spaces become more inclusive that more people are brought into it i i don't i, I think on my bad days i want to burn it all down and start again but on my better days i sort of feel like no it's more important that we have more more people in the conversation more people in the institutions this is how we're going to change things i think there's something about you have to attach yourself very kind of tentatively to something in order to do the work you're doing. I mean, even the journal that I run with Anna Misiak, you know, it's completely free, it's completely open access, nobody pays for anything, you know, we don't have any products we sell. But, you know, my, my institution, the University of Gothenburg, does pay for our server. I mean, it's not a huge amount of money. It's like $30 a month. But still, that adds up and they do pay for that. But they also are quite clear on that they don't dictate any of our content or the direction of the journal or what the journal stands for. But, you know, I, I consider myself both inside and outside of the system. And that, that is how my work functions. I can't do my work otherwise. This actually, um, uh, this, this idea of being inside and, uh, and outside or, or the obligation in a way of being precarious to be feminist is something that came up in the, in the, in the panel uh, last, uh, last week about uh, production and about artists uh, needed, needing to be kind of um, uh, needed to be hungry <laughs> to be able to produce art, which I think it's a very, uh, it's a very strange uh, way, but it is also it's a strange, um, it's a strange thing, but it's, as you said, Ilya, I think it's a, and, um, and Anna, it's a, it's a way of uh, keeping, um, keeping the voices that disturb out as well, um, of trying to keep them out of the system in a way. Um, but I, I think as well that Anna, your, um, your journal is a very, um, is a very affirmative initiative in, in academia of, um, of wanting to claim um, the open access back um, and, and, and the sharing of knowledge rather than the um, gatekeeping around it. Um, yeah, I think we're also trying to sort of um, rethink what could count as as academic writing or academic thought as well because there is this very bizarre idea that academic writing is this dry objective enterprise which i think bad academic writing is i can say that um but that's not the kind of writing that we welcome at, at my at the journal so 
um, I, I think there's something about trying to undo the sort of hierarchies of knowledge and the way in which we also interact with the board. I mean, obviously, Anna and I do the majority of the work on the journal, but we do have this very vast, unwieldy board that functions as a collective, as a kind of space for, for venting, for support, all sorts of things. But, you know, they also have a distinct say in the direction of the journal and the, the issues we produce and... Um, what we stand for as well. Um. Yeah, and I, I think um, uh, Emily posted in the chat the the link to the journal. I think make sure to uh, make sure to check it because it has, uh, as you as you said, it it is also um, it is also trying to provide a, a content in a different uh, in a lot of different formats, and that's what I uh, I really love about this uh, about your journal as well. Um, is that it, it also um, it, it broadens the audience completely of, uh, of academia and that's uh, that's important uh, as you said earlier also of breaking up the ivory tower and not being clustered as either um, artist or entertainment or uh, academic or uh, critic or but rather trying to um, to build bridges in a way So I think we uh, need to um, to wrap up now because it's already one. Um, but I really, uh, really, really enjoyed talking to uh, all of you. Um, I don't know if you have uh, closing words that you want to uh, share, or especially Rosalind, if you uh, because you didn't have uh, so much uh, uh, talk time. So um, yeah, if if you want to share something, um, then you can do that now. Otherwise. Um, we can uh, just um, meet again next week at uh, 10. Oh, I'll just say that, yeah, I completely agree with um, what, what Anna just said um, and, and Ilya as well, and this idea of the inside and the outside. And um, years ago, decades ago, I read a book called In and Against the State, and it was about the importance of working everywhere where we are and not just kind of um, deciding to only work on one strategy. And the other thing I just wanted to say was, I, I feel that one thing that's really come out from um, all of us in a sense is the importance of, of collaboration and the importance of the collective. And that's something that I experienced very much at a felt level, just all it takes is having, you know, a few people that you really want to do work with and you can change the world. You can do amazing things. So. I think I'll just end on that note, <laughs> affirmative note. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, closing affirmative note. I think that was great. Um, so um, I, I really, really would like to thank you uh, all the, the panelists for accepting my invitation to, uh, to talk this morning and uh, to all the participants for joining us and for their questions and interactions. So um, yes, let's meet uh, next week if you uh, want to uh, <laughs> uh, at 10 uh, for uh, the last uh, panel on distribution and curation. Thank you very much and have a lovely day. Bye-bye. <laughs>